Welcome, everybody. Um, happy De December. Ready for the holidays, I'm sure, and some time off, hopefully. Um, we, uh, you know, we have an exciting agenda today, as usual. Uh, but I do want to welcome all our old friends, uh, some old friends that are um, signing in. I see in the chat pod and um, on the attendee list and some new friends, and then some want to have a special welcome for folks in the trucking community that may be joining us today to hear, hear how Tim and, um, and the trucking are related. We are very much interrelated here, um, as, as you well know, um, in the trucking community, and we certainly know it in the Tim community. So I think we need to, uh, you know, we, we've always, we've been striving for some time to find ways to work a little closer together, and we we, we have. Um, excuse me. Um, so today's agenda, as you'll hear from Jim and I, um, hopefully not briefly, but give you an update on, on our Tim program. Uh, we're co-managers, uh, along with uh, Joe Tebow um, for the Federal Highway Program. We're going to hear from Roger Stryker from uh, the Oklahoma TIM Program, we'll hear about some special aspects to their program. Um, and um, uh, and then uh, we're going to hear from John uh, McNoll, I'm sorry I butchered that name, <laughs> McNoll, um, and Rebecca Brewster on uh, in-cab alerts for trucks com commercial. This is going to be a pretty cool presentation, not, not so much of a presentation, a slight presentation, then a discussion between Re Rebecca and John. And um, I'll exp talk a little bit about Rebecca uh, before I introduce uh, those speakers. And then uh, last but certainly not least is uh, Ying Yang Lu, um, who is working on a Tim Benefit Cost Tool. We're updating a tool that we already had. Uh, we had a, a webinar yesterday, so some of you uh, that are attending both, it may be, um, may be repetitive for you. But um, I do want to make everyone aware of, of the tool and our interest in getting input from you uh, on updating uh, as we update the tool uh, very rapidly. We have a very quick, um, quick things. So, some um, updates from us. Uh, so the next, uh, we have new fact sheets that we that are in the. Um, what do you call that pod? Uh, the you know download pod. Uh, we have them on. Um, uh, um, well, I guess I'll get, I'll get to that slide. We're going to talk about the pool fund study and uh, cross responder safety week, um, and then the Tim training and the Tim train trainer course update. So the fact sheets that we um, that we have available to you. Now, what are fact sheets? If you don't know, they're um, you know one page. Well, one page, both sides that you can use when you're trying to explain a program to you know your colleagues that may not even understand what Tim is, um, the various aspects of our program. So uh, you'll, you'll see them up there, I won't read them to you, but um, these fact sheets can help you uh, when you're trying to explain uh, in, in sort of like an elevator speech, or you just want to take them to a Tim committee meeting and, uh, and, um, and provide some information. Uh, those, those are there for you. Uh, they're in the download. They will be up on our, um, on our website, the Federal Highway, Traffic Incident Management Office of Operations website, uh, uh, but they're not quite there yet. It's probably going to be a few more weeks, maybe maybe a month with the holidays coming up, but they will eventually be there. And if you had a need for any of these, you can just reach out to Jim or I anyway. So, um, so we we have a, 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 a pool fund study, the Safety Service Patrol pool fund study. If you don't know what these are, the, these um, each state has afforded the opportunity with some federal research money to um, participate, to devote, um, in this case, it's a small amount of money, 25000 per state, to, uh, to um, participate in, in different studies. In, the, in this case, it's a, it's a pool fund study on service patrols. It's a, the group just uh, of leaders throughout the country wanted to um, sort of um, gather information and sort of try an attempt to standardize procedures and training and um, and just uh, you know advance the state of the practice uh, the profession in um, you know in, in a group in a group setting sort of learn on each other coincidentally some of the the states that are listed there are among the best in the country so um, although we're starting we're starting the pool fund we we certainly, and it looks like the pool fund is active, but we're we're open to uh, more participants um, if that is um, 
of interest to you, let me know, and we'll we'll coordinate it. Um, the yeah, well, okay, I guess I forgot I had this slide, but um, so we want to establish tools and technical reports for best practices of safety service patrols, um, align best practices to address some of the issues, right? There's common issues with, this, you know, the service patrols, and then um, we, you want to have a recognized standard, so, uh, and that will be a, a working group and a contractor, and, um, and it, again, it's, it's a small amount of money for your research. You, you reach out to your research office at your state DOT and they, uh, if they uh, determine uh, they have, uh, they're able to participate, they'll, they'll we'll handle it from there for you. Uh, just a quick overview, you know, uh, the second week of November we had a, what we felt was a very successful crash responder safety week. Um, you know, the, the whole idea was to reach out to folks and to, um, you know, make an increased awareness of, uh, well, first of all, responder safety, that's our first interest anyways, and then uh, all the aspects of um, of, of the of Tim, uh, we try to we try to push along as well, but most of all, respond to safety. So we were very excited by our um, you know new portion, our new name, and uh, the, some of the social media activities you'll see there. But I like that 2.15 million um, uh, reach reached. So I don't know what all this, these numbers mean. I'm not a social media guy. Um, you know, social media likes. 3,466. Anyways, those seem like good numbers to me. <laughs> so um, just wanted to let you know we thought we had a successful week. We had a great um, a great kickoff um, with 270 participants um, on, on Monday, uh, and they all had short notices. We had a bunch of proclamations that went out. Um, uh, uh, 12 states actually got the governors to sign a proclamation, and that's um, double what we had in the previous year. So, uh, you know, that, that, that was successful. We hope to expand on all this stuff even more um, in the more um, in going into the future. And the, uh, the hits on the NOCO website, the, web, the CRSW website, uh, was the um, second largest, the only um, eclipse by the solar eclipse. So... Um, Pretty cool there. Next month, next month, uh, you're going to be back to our routine fourth Wednesday of each month. Next month, we're going to be featuring the Illinois TIM program with um, some tra cool training videos that they put together. Robin Hemlisch is a very active member of our community, uh, one of our leaders in the country, and um, she'll be providing some, uh, some pretty cool information on that. Um, we're also going to be having uh, some information on uh, from USDOT, Volpe Center, Anita Kim is going to be sharing some information about, you know, the automated driving systems, uh, automated vehicles, and where responders can get information when they're having a bad, you know, when they're having an incident out, out there. Uh, so that's, um, uh, there's some um, places where, where she's going to be able to point you to, to um, you know, to, to um you know, to get information on specific makes and models uh, when it happens. It's not comprehensive, but it, we're starting down the path of, um, of, being, of hoping to share that information with the responder community. And, uh, and then we're also going to have um, some from Wisconsin DOT, the Traffic Management Center, uh, video sharing and recording and, and um, you know, some information on what they do. Some, some folks, it's routine to, to record and to share your video. Others, it's not. So we wanted to share that information. That's part of our Everyday Counts program, that last bullet, uh, as, as well. So uh, with that, I'm going to pass it on to my um, partner in crime, Mr. Jim Ostrich. Jim, you there? Uh-oh. Jim? Hello. Hello. We can hear you, Paul. Okay. Okay. <laughs> we can't hear Jim, though. Right. Okay. All right, well, I'm going to move on. These are Jim's slides here, so I'm going to um, do the best I can to give an update 
on the um, total trained. Um, many of you, most of you receive this um, about every two weeks, not exactly, but about every two weeks. So you'll see the, uh, you know, we, we continue to, even during COVID, we've continued to make progress, um, you know, with, with the folks trained through our in-person and web-based and, um, and, uh, um, and other methods. So it's, um, you know, we're, we're, uh, we're very pleased, um, but, you know, we're not pleased about um, the um, bad news that we have. The fatalities are at 58 for this calendar year, um, so uh, for 2021, it's last year it was I think it was 47. So we're going in the wrong direction. Um, and just so that you know, everywhere, every place we hear uh, fatalities, uh, um, uh, speeding tickets, uh, speed is up higher than um, than than it normally would be, and um, so you know we you know we we have an we have an issue here, right? Even though we all been working, many of us would be um, would be um, you know working hard to try to protect responders when they're out there. We're still having a problem, and it's increasing and not getting worse. Heaven forbid uh, it continues to get worse. But I think we you know we're working in the right direction. We're doing the right thing here. So. Uh, these are just the train the trainer um, sessions that we have um, we ha we have conducted since the begin the beginning of the program. Uh, some of them are um, <clears throat> federal highway sponsored trainers, um, and then there's, um, a number of local train the trainer sessions that have been there as well. Then there's some we 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 um, we've been you know we we partnered with the state on a train the train the trainer sessions. And some of you may know, all of you may know, we've been doing uh, some um, um, virtual train-the-trainer sessions that have been very successful, we, we, we hope. As long as people go out and do some training, we think it's going to be um, good and successful. So um, just want to check, Jim, are you back? No? Okay. Then, um, you know, the number of... Of, of people trained, uh, there's over 13,000 that have tent, attended to train the trainer, and uh, our, our pet peeve, especially Tim's uh, Jim's pet peeve, is um, the um, you know only a small percentage of those folks that we have run through a train the trainer session up, you know, actually doing some training. So uh, we're always looking to up those numbers and to up the percentage of people that are participating. So. Um, There's, um, there's a breakdown by state of the folks trained. So you'll see the, um, uh, the numbers in your state right there. Just a different version of that total trained. Um, we're combining the web-based training with the in-person training. And um, here's the... Um, percentage trained map, uh, the one we, you know, that's very special is some people that, that you know, that, that some states that jump out at us. So a couple of states are at 100%. Georgia is at 104%. So uh, um, we know that, you know, we maybe need to adjust some numbers there. Um, and uh, so, uh, but, you know, a lot of states are doing really fantastic with their percentages. And the percentages were just a goal, a goal we were trying to achieve. We knew, we, we, you know, the numbers uh, were just estimates. So, uh, and that, you know, that's evidenced by the 104%. Um, percent. So, um, but anyways, uh, keep training. This is the breakdown of the, um, the disciplines. Fire and rescue, beating everybody else. But... Um, and these are, this is a list of um, progress since uh, the last in the last couple of weeks since um, uh, November 22nd. Uh, the number of folks that, that have been trained. I'm not going to read all the states to you, but we you know we thought we wanted to we'd share the, these with the nation um, as as we you know identify states that are most most active. 
Yeah, so uh, North Carolina wins, or oh, Texas wins the award uh, this, this, um, this, this last period of this month, and um, followed by North Carolina and Pennsylvania, all doing really good work. New Jersey, Rhode Island, Georgia, Colorado, Iowa, missed Iowa, don't want to do that, Arkansas, Oklahoma. So everyone's still, uh, you know, under tough circumstances with competing priorities is, um, is making progress, and uh, we wanted to give a shout out to those that are doing a, a superb job. So um, not the rest of you are not, but you know, if you're not, if you want to see your name, your state up there, let's go, let's go, let's have some uh, um, friendly competition here. So we had some train the trainer sessions, as I as I mentioned, we had um, 30 participation um, participants in uh, November. Uh, 30th and December 1st um, from 12 different states uh, on um, December 9th and 10th, 32 participants from 16 states. And then um, we, we do have uh, another session um, that's tomorrow and um, I guess there's two, two separate sessions, both eight hours uh, with, um, uh, you know, as you see right there on the, on the schedule, good registration. You know, we don't want too many folks in the, uh, in a train the trainer session, so 34 is a good number, and 45 is a is a is a big number. So one for the West Coast and one for the East Coast. But if either one of them fit for you, let us know, and we'll um, we'll we'll be able to participate with it. So that's our Tim team, Joe, um, myself, and Jim, and um, we're here to we're here to work with you. So <clears throat> next up is. Um, Mr. Roger Stryker from Oklahoma, who is going to um, share with us uh, some information and um, on the Oklahoma program. The Oklahoma program was one of the very first states to adopt the training, and um, uh, you know, just like all the states, has had some ups and downs. But now they're on; they're doing very well. Uh, and as you see, they're on the um, the leading list of having trained some folks this past couple of weeks. And, um, but with that, I'll you know, stop talking and uh, hand it over to uh, Roger for an update on what's happening in Oklahoma. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. Uh, I want to thank everyone for the opportunity today to share, uh, speak today and share Oklahoma's history and a little bit of success and kind of our future plans with TIMS. Uh, history of TIMS Coalition, since we established it in 2015, uh, Gentlemen and I, Alan Sanders and I, got the opportunity to go to do the uh, train the trainer in Emmitsburg in the summer of 2015, and and uh, we just wanted to pick up there and, and kind of give us some fresh feet, some some fresh look with what OHP and others had started back in 2013 here in the state. And uh, so Alan and I, coming back on the airplane, we decided we was going to just uh, you know try to get through some of the stuff and and just get some training out there to everybody, and uh, so. We just wanted to, our goal was just to get out there and increase awareness across the state. Uh, sometimes there can be some uh, red tape or whatever you want to call it to kind of get in the way of success sometimes. But uh, our goal was uh, we're both retired in the fire service and EMS field, and uh, we've been out there, been you know, about hit a few times, this and that, and everybody you know has that experience. And uh, so we decided to get out there and just get some training going. So through some classes and train the trainer classes, uh, we initially started putting that on and, and did a blast and got us about 450 instructors across the state. And as you well know, as time goes on, people move on and retire and so forth. And so uh, to this day, currently now, we have about 150 uh, instructors out there working it. And, uh, and there could be more, and that, and that number varies from, from year to year and uh, how active it is. And of course, with last year's um, situation, with everybody kind of hurt heard a lot of uh, training out there but as we went on there as we got going in 2015 within a couple of years uh, we kind of doubled our our student numbers there that we'd got to train so we really had initially made a pretty good jump on that and and a lot of that helped with uh, some of our agencies requiring the training they saw how important it was and so uh, DPS with within Oklahoma I said uh, well for the record services we want to make the Tim's training mandatory so that helped with that as well as our EMS uh, field that uh, rec highly recommended it as well. So that helped 
was getting our numbers doubled. And, and again, with that blast of a lot of uh, classes that we pushed out, we just covered the state from corner to corner, and we just we just tried to do it as much as we could and, and uh, get that momentum going and get the word out. So it's, it's such a uh, great information out there. And ironically, I went through my whole 25 plus years career in the fire service without even having this training. So uh, it hits close home to me with uh, having some uh, close friends and brothers in the fire service that's been struck and, and killed in the past. And so that's got my uh, passion behind it, even though that I'm retired and still want to get out there and uh, share this information because it's never going to go away. We've got to continue to be training on this and be successful. So we evaluated our state's responder totals, and uh, currently we're just over 26,000 responders uh, that uh, we need to get trained. We got to where we were leading the nation there in percentage of responders for a while. We were approaching 100%, kind of saturating what we thought was our numbers, and we kind of realized that we felt like we still had a lot of uh, classes to put on, and so we went back and we started recalculating our numbers of, of, through the agencies of how many we have out there. So. Uh, for a few years, we did uh, lead the nation across as far as the percentages out there, and then we we uh, upped our numbers and uh, you know stepped up a, a little bit more and got some new numbers, and we dropped back down, and we're roughly around 62% trained right now, and, and still trying to move forward and and uh, get that back up to the high 90s, if not 100%, and then redo those numbers again and just keep working at it. So that's kind of a little bit of a history about how we got that started, and. Uh, so other coalition activities, we put together uh, Tim's, uh, Oklahoma Tim's coalition, and uh, one of the big things that we've done, we've tried to build, and we have built and managed an OKTim.org website. Well, it's just a website for, for Oklahoma, and it's run by ODOT and uh, managed by myself. It's for a place where students and instructors and resources are there for all of our instructors to keep updated on the information and have all the resources they need to conduct those classes. It's also a place where we can keep certificates in there and, and uh, produce certificates and uh, try to keep a good uh, a good place or a one-stop shop place for that TIMS training. Right now we have a lot of instructors that's not uh, associated with us directly within the OKTIM.org uh, website and we're working on that to uh, continue to get that to grow. Another project we worked on is the uh, ODOT Cable Barrier Safety Awareness video, and uh, something we didn't have here in Oklahoma, and we've had a situation a few years ago that really nobody had the right idea of where to go to, who to ask the right questions and as far as getting uh, situations handled or incidents out there on the roadway. So one of our uh, Tim's instructors, OHP officer, came to us with, with here at the uh, Oklahoma Department of Transportation and said, can we build an awareness video so we can get it out there and get some right, true information out there so that everyone will know what to do? So it took about two years to get that produced here within within ODOT and, and all the manpower we have there, the video team and everybody. And uh, we produced a six-and-a-half-minute video that is simply a, an awareness video that realized that it's dangerous out there, what you're doing. If you not know, you don't understand what that is, uh, you can watch this video, and at the end of our video, it, it talks about who you can contact in your area, whether it's with the Turnpike Authority or whether it's with Department of Transportation, and get some more resources there and get some more training or ha answer some more questions you have about that. And so it really turned out well. Uh, that that uh, the video is on uh, on the homepage there at OKTim.org if you uh, choose to want to go and 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 uh, view that. And also this past year in 2020, within, within the record services, uh, before you can renew your license, uh, TIMS is one of the 16, now 20 hours of class that you have to have in order to get your license renewed with the, within DPS here in Oklahoma. So uh, they came to us and wanted our Oklahomanized uh, four-hour online class produced so that it was available 24-7 because with, with COVID and everything happening on there, we you know, we shut down the face-to-face -face classes and so forth, but, but again, uh, life continued on in the record service industry specifically. You know, they needed something, and they needed something, you know, quite often. So uh, I got that put together, and we got that on our website. So that's what's helping our numbers here recently within the last six months start to climb back up steadily because uh, of some online uh, users out there. And it's open not just to record service industry. It's open to all of our agencies. 
that uh, that need the Tim's class. So, and we're constantly um, recruiting instructors to join OK Tim uh, to corral those student numbers. So, because not all of our instructors across the state are within our uh, coalition, and we're working on that all the time to get everybody together and and uh, push for the same cause and make sure that all of our numbers get uh, counted and everything. And then uh, Oklahoma, uh, the Tim's Coalition, actually, we got involved with uh, LTAP a few years ago. And a little bit of history on the LTAP was that it was proposed by Dr. Chamblin to the Federal Highway Administration in, uh, in 1982. And today it's, it's here and it's across the nation and, and seven tribal technical assistance programs known as a TTAP. And the program's mission is to promote uh, professionalism, efficiency, quality training to Oklahomans and others across the country. And their training includes state legislated accreditation programs, workshops and seminars, regional and national technical conferences, satellite teleconferences, uh, distance learning broadcasts, and professional development retreats. And the LTAP's Road Scholar Program is an educational certification series offered to county and municipal and tribal and government elected officials and their employees across the state. And that program consists of eight courses that total about 112 hours of instruction and laboratory experience. And a few of those are just you know how uh, aggregate road maintenance to excavation safety, testing soil priorities or properties and uh, the MUTCD manual part six, uh, pavement presentation, project management, a whole lot of stuff. And it includes the TIM program. And the uh, OK TIM Coalition's involvement with LTAPS is the four-hour TIMS class. Uh, we set up a classroom for our students at a chosen location across the state. And then we will connect virtually with other uh, multiple career tech technology centers across the state. And by doing this, we're able to offer this class clear across the state, kind of a blast, if you will. You don't have to drive clear across the state and go to a, a career tech center near you and be able to view that class as I do it live some other location. And that's been a big help for that uh, Road Scholar program. So that's, it's been a big success. And uh, it's one way that we were able to help with some that uh, really need that class and, and uh, we're able to help them with that. And another big project we have going on is uh, oh, right before the pandemic hit, we were having meetings and trying to work on uh, our new young drivers and, and I was teaching a class a few years back and and you know we're always trying to uh, educate the, the driver that has experience whether they have one two three or 20 or 30 or 50 years experience of driving uh, with the distractions that are out there uh, you know and I just got to think well we're kind of trying to fix this on the back end of this let's try to also fix this on the front end and I mean that by let's work on the new drivers let's work on the ones that don't have any experience at it per se and that let's teach them what the problem is out there let's teach them and make them understand that there's a four-hour class out there for rescuers and responders people that's going out there on the side of the road to help you and uh and that we get this in our, our state's driver's manual get some information in there about tims and not just only our state supplemental laws but about the tims uh, training itself and let's get some test questions on there because we've learned here that it seems like if it's not on the test, it doesn't always get taught in the class. And so by realizing that and, and doing some research, we were working on and we got together with a committee within our coalition and uh, we put together some information and, and I've got some good news a couple of days ago that looks like that that's still moving forward in a positive direction and that uh, hopefully as the uh, our real ID program gets moving forward. It's it's part of that process, and that it is coming forward. So, really excited about that. Uh, and again, it, to me, this Tim training is is never going to go away, and it's, it's something that is very important out there. And so, I look forward to seeing that in our tri our drivers manual and and educating our young drivers uh, around the state when they uh, go out there and take their test and and be out there and be on the roadway. So. But that, that's uh, all I have uh, at this time. 
Thank you, Roger. Good presentation. Some cool things going on there, <coughs> excuse me, in Oklahoma. Um, you know, I'm going to just, um, I love that whole idea of that um, remote um, location. So while you're teaching class, while Roger's teaching in class, there's some remote tech centers that are participating with that. And if, if you don't know what an LTAP center is, every state has an LTAP center, I believe every state, um, and it's usually run through the, the, the state DOT. Um, but, you know, they, they, they can be very good participants um, and partners with you with the training. That's probably a, in a handful of states the LTAP center um, participates. Um, and the other thing, I mean, there's a, all this stuff is cool, but the other thing is um, we've heard about for a long time is about getting some of the Tim questions um, on the drivers um, in the driver's manual, right? M many there's many states have questions on the move over law, but there's even more to it than that. So uh, that's something we've talked about, um, and, and so instead of um, Oklahoma just talking about it, they went and made it happen. They're in the progress of making it happen. It's not done yet, but it's it, um, it's a, it's a great idea, and I applaud you for it. <clears throat> So next up is um, um, is a, a, a little section on the towing community. But before I uh, introduce um, uh, John, well, let actually Rebecca introduce him because I think I butchered his name in the beginning. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about our friend Rebecca Brewster that um, many of you don't no, uh, but she's been instrumental with Tim for many years. She's, um, she actually was the principal investigator and the lead manager for the, the development of the National Responder Training Program, which most of you are familiar with. So it was her, her project to start with, and as long as TRB had it before they handed it over to Federal Highway to, to handle, it was um, Rebecca that was um, leading the charge, and um, and and she did a, a fantastic job with that. Rebecca is also uh, the manager, uh, the contract manager for our um, our, our annual self-assessment, and um, so uh, she's uh, in some ways, in, in a lot of ways, a Tim expert, uh, but behind the scenes doing some. Big, big, big time work, and um, but incidentally, her main business, her main focus in in her professional life is is trucking and supporting the trucking industry in research. So, um, you know, I don't want to say too many good things beyond that. Other than um, I'll let Rebecca do the talking and introduce John and in, uh, in America's Road uh, team captain, uh, whatever that, whatever exactly that is. So, with that, Rebecca, I'll let you take it. Thank you so much, Paul, and, and I appreciate the introduction, and I, I really appreciate the opportunity to join everyone today to talk about the other side of my professional career when I'm not supporting uh, Federal Highway on the Tim Self-Assessment, which I very much enjoy and, and have been doing since 2002. Uh, I'm very excited today that, to have my guest, John McCowan, uh, with me. John is a professional truck driver with T-Force Freight. He's been a truck driver for 23 years and has accumulated over 2.2 million accident-free miles. John also serves as an America's Road Team Captain, and the Road Team Captains are a very elite group of professional truck drivers who go through a, a selection process uh, to represent the trucking industry at industry at, at events all around the country to educate the public on the criticality of the trucking industry on career potential in the trucking industry, and most importantly for our purposes today, how to safely share the road with large uh, trucks uh, so that the public knows what they should and should not be doing as they're navigating and sharing the road with large trucks. Before becoming a professional truck driver, John served as both a military and a civilian law enforcement officer and a traffic accident investigator. So I, I think he's the perfect choice to join us on this Talking Tim webinar today. So John, welcome. We're glad to have you. Well, thank you so much. I'm uh, glad to be here. Thank you. So um, I thought, Paul, uh, before we get into the conversation with John and I, I just wanted to share a few uh, data points from ATRI's research. As, as you mentioned, uh, ATRI is the trucking industry's research organization. And one of the things we do is an annual survey of the industry, both motor carriers or trucking fleets and truck drivers, 
to identify the top issues of concern, uh, the areas that are most impacting our ability to serve the nation's supply chain. Our most recent results are on the slide here, and you can see that infra transportation infrastructure and congestion comes in at number eight on the list. It actually dropped off out of the top 10 in 2020 when congestion was down due to the pandemic, but uh, obviously it's back up in the top 10 again this year and actually came in one position higher than it had been in 2019. Those are the overall results. This is what it looks like when you break out the responses by how John and his peers around the country rank the issues versus how motor carriers rank the issue, and, and both have transportation infrastructure and congestion at number eight, but I just wanted to point out that on the professional driver side, truck parking is a number one concern for drivers, and I know that's something John's going to touch on when he's talking about incident impacts. Another annual research study we do at ATRI um, is to collect very detailed financial data from hundreds of trucking fleets to come up with an average cost per mile and cost per hour to operate a truck. Um, here's the most recent findings, and you can see in the bottom right that every hour that a truck is sitting stuck in traffic, um, it is costing that motor carrier, on average, nearly uh, $67. Multiply that by the number of trucks in congestion and the hours spent stuck in that congestion, and you can see why the trucking industry is so invested in doing whatever we can to avoid being in that, in that congestion. In fact, at ATRI, we did an analysis um, to quantify the total cost of congestion to the trucking industry several years ago, and in 2016, that cost was $74.5 billion. But what I think is even more compelling is that number below that, the second bullet point, which is the productivity lost to congestion for the trucking industry, 1.2 billion hours or the equivalent of 425,000 truck drivers sitting still for an entire year. Right now, uh, with the supply chain issues, you've heard about the truck driver shortage. It's, it's been around for years, but you, you're hearing more about it certainly now. It's estimated to be about 80,000 drivers. And as a result of congestion, we, we have what equates to about 425,000 drivers sitting still. So imagine uh, how much more efficient the supply chain could be if drivers weren't sitting stuck in that traffic. That obviously uh, comes with an added cost to our fuel bill and with that additional um, emissions impacts that could be avoided if we could keep the trucks moving. Um, just one other point, uh, that was overall congestion. We also annually track uh, the nation's worst truck bottlenecks using a, a data set of over a million trucks worth of GPS data. And so I, I know John is familiar with a number of these spots. And, and how difficult they are for trucks to navigate through. And even in 2020, uh, when traffic congestion was way down because all the four, we call them four-wheelers, car drivers, uh, were at home during the early parts of the pandemic. So you saw truck speeds go up based on the GPS data, but you still had average speeds at, at these top 10 locations well below the posted speed limit because of congestion. So it, it is costly for us as an industry, and, and certainly um, we are very invested in figuring out how to minimize the time that drivers spent stuck in, in uh, incident-related congestion. So, John, welcome again. Um, why don't you start by, by sharing with everyone the real practical impacts on truck drivers from that congestion, and particularly when the, it's the result of a major incident that shuts down lanes of traffic for hours. Well, there's a lot of, uh, and, and as you said on that list, I've probably been to practically every place on your list there. Um, in my 23 years as a truck driver, I've, I've driven a, a truck in every state in the United States and every province of Canada, except Alaska and Hawaii, of course. So I've seen a lot uh, of, of congestion. Uh, the issue is, uh, you know, is when you have the congestion, you're dealing with hours of service now, uh, electronic hours of service. Um, you're dealing with uh, maybe you're close to running out of time and you got to get a parking place. Uh, and you, you're always having to think that. You have to always be on top of your hours of service because it's your responsibility to make sure that you're off the road safely when, when your hours of services are up. So, you know, you got these work zones that pop up. Uh, 
you know, here in Pennsylvania, they do a lot of this, what they call a rolling roadblock, where they might be just patching one area of a road or out on the turnpike. They're making a whole new area, uh, and they, they do blasting, so they do rolling roadblocks. And you never know when those are going to happen, and it affects us tremendously with our appointments, again, with our stopping uh, for our uh, mandatory 30-minute break before our eighth hour. All this has to be uh, in your mind and thinking about what you want to do, uh, where you might be able to stop when, when that happens. So uh, I think the biggest thing that, Rebecca, affects me is, is my hours of service. You know, we do our very best not to violate. Of course, I don't violate whatsoever. I'll shut it down. But we have to always be on the alert, always be ready to make those changes to figure out, okay, this interstate is blocked. How do I get around it? Can I, is there low bridges? Is there a, a small town? Can I make those turns? It's just all this has to be run through your mind all the time. And it does affect uh, us out on the highway day to day to day. Well, and John, you make a good point because I know that a lot of the folks who are involved in traffic incident management are very um, keyed in on identifying alternate routes when there is going to be a major shutdown um, so that they can route the, reroute the traffic around that incident while the first responders are dealing with it and getting that incident dealt with. But, but those alternate routes aren't always ideal for commercial trucks, particularly if you're a placarded load and you've got hazmat and then you're limited on where you can go. So, so you need as much advance notice of these situations as you can to adjust accordingly. Yeah, that's correct. We, yes, you're exactly right. And being a, a, a first responder in the past, I have been standing on the side of the road when the trucks or cars are, are going by. So I have a, a real sensitivity to that um, when I approach an accident or a road construction and the, the guys are out, you know, working on the road and doing what they're supposed to be doing. So uh, I think some of this web-based training that we're talking about that, that Tim has to offer, it would be phenomenal uh, for our uh, new drivers. As Roger said, we like getting into the high schools early to talk about sharing the road around trucks and, and with Oklahoma getting into the schools or getting into people that, that's first getting their license. That, that is a phenomenal idea to train them before they get out on the highway, get out on the road. And, you know, uh, I think that I would even say I think it ought to be a requirement throughout the whole United States that, that you know, people uh, – as they said, where you got five years experience, zero years experience, or 50, to, again, take a look at it, reassess yourself uh, going into these construction zones and all this stuff, and, and, and get retrained. Training never hurts, never hurts whatsoever. Absolutely. So, John, let's turn a little bit to um, – in cab alerts, and I, I know you, like a lot of professional truck drivers, receive incident information to give you a heads up when you've got an incident on your route. And, and there are a number of services that provide this data to truckers through their onboard telematic systems. Why don't you share how you get that info, what you like about it, and how you use it? I'm sure I was off mute. I'm sorry. Uh, yep. Uh, I, uh, we, I get an alert on my, uh, on my GPS. I signed up for a traffic alert and, and I get that alert. Sometimes it's not as quick as I like. Uh, again, if something just pops up, obviously it's going, you're going to have to, to deal with that situation. But what I like about it is again, if I see something going on 30 miles from, from where I'm at or, or 50 miles, if there's an accident, interstate 81, and I live in Pennsylvania, so. I do the 81 corridor a lot. I see the Interstate 81 is, is closed down for some reason for an accident, or we just had one yesterday out on Interstate 78 involving a bus and a truck, and Interstate 78 was closed for several hours. You have the capability and the time to reassess that, knowing how much time you need to get around it. You can get around it, and it's, it's really truly priceless uh, for us with the in-cab notifications. Uh, again, sometimes it don't come quick enough, but 
it, it's it's there, and we get an, I get an alert. My my screen goes red, and I know because the GPS is right in front of me. I see what what's there, and without being totally distracted, I'm not looking down at a computer screen or whatever. It's it's right square in front of me, and 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 then it tells me. Uh, mine even goes and says a quicker route has been determined. Would you like to take that route? And through my GPS, is through my headset. I just push a button and talk to my GPS, and it does it for me. I don't have to be distracted. I don't have to to do it, touch buttons or recalculate and all that stuff. Uh, being distracted inside the cab, so uh, it it is very helpful for us uh, for uh, numerous reasons. Hours of service, where we have to take a break, et cetera, et cetera our appointment times and, and all that. So it's it's truly priceless to get that information immediately and as, as accurate as possible so we can make those adjustments. And John, I know I, I mentioned during um, my uh, slide deck that, that truck parking is a number one concern for drivers. When you're going to have a shutdown, I mean, think about if you could uh, develop a, a, an ideal system for a truck driver that would give notices of of, of an incident that's going to shut down your route for a while. Imagine if you could overlay where there was available parking um, for commercial vehicles at that time. So if you were getting close on your mandated hours of service, um, and for those who, who don't know, truck drivers are regulated on how long they can drive and be on duty, and they've got an electronic clock ticking in their truck um, telling them how much available time they have. So, John, imagine you get a notification from your system that says um, it, it, there's an incident ahead, uh, the interstate is expected to be shut down for a few hours, and, by the way, here's available parking where you could pull off, safely pull off, um, if you need to do so. I, I, I mean, I think there are a lot of possibilities for what what we could ideally look for in a system like that. You know, that would be, that would save, in the long run, uh, Rebecca, as you showed on one of your slides, the money that we waste in just sitting and idling or whatever, that would save millions and millions of dollars to the fleets and to the drivers and to everyone. That would be phenomenal to have a system that Okay, Interstate 81 is shut down. I've got an hour and 15 minutes, and within that hour and 15 minutes, here is four tr tr uh, truck stops or four areas, maybe a rest area with – I mean, some states have a sign-up that says there's seven rest area spots open or 30, whatever it might be. I've seen those signs around the country. So if we had a system that fed that information right in cab, and I think with satellites, I don't know why it's not possible to do that. I mean, just immediately submit that to us and then give us the opportunity to select those within an hour and a half. You got an hour and a half to drive and you got an hour and 15 minutes to drive. So within an hour, because you know, you don't want to have an hour and a half to drive and in an hour and 25 minutes, you're still looking at a place to park because at an hour and a half, your hours of service is over. It doesn't care. The system doesn't care that you're in the parking lot looking. You need to be parked safely, off-duty, ready to take your rest break. That would be, I said it before, I'll say it again, that would be priceless if we could come up with something like that to help alleviate. And it would alleviate congestion on the road. Guys wouldn't have to think, well, maybe I can, maybe, let me see, it's 60 miles. If I do this many miles an hour, I can really go that fast. All that stuff would be alleviated. It would be on your system, on your telematics, pops up right in front of you that gives you that idea. Just make it would look. Our job is not easy out here anyway, and it would just make our job so much easier. And for the new guys coming in, to you know, I've been out here a long time. I've I've seen a lot of stuff, but for the new people coming in, the men and women coming in to the industry, if you can make their job easier, it, it just would make it more attractive. I would think so. I think that would be a phenomenal idea. So, so a great recruitment tool for us, or a retention tool for us, for sure. Well, I think so. so if you can make our job easier, uh, you know, I mean, it's hard enough anyway. Uh, and make our job easy. We have, listen, this is the greatest industry I've ever been involved with. Uh, I love what I do. Uh, and 
But if you can make my job just a little bit easier, that's one thing that I can take off my mind, know that that system's watching me, just like our blind spots or our uh, crash mitigation systems. I know that my blind spot indicator on my truck is always watching my blind spot. I don't have to worry about if I look or turn my head, that light is on either green or yellow or red. That's something I don't have to worry about. I know it's there. So if, if we could come up with something that – it will just ease the mind of the driver a little bit that knows that, hey, maybe running short, but this thing's got me. It'll be able to show me where I can go and, and get parts. Well, thanks, John. And, and on behalf of everyone, I want to thank you and all the other 3.3 million professional truck drivers out there for what you do each and every day to keep our economy moving. Paul, I, I don't know if we answered a lot of questions. We, we, we came up with a wish list of what might be great for drivers, but um, we're happy to answer any questions if uh, there are any uh, at the end of the presentation. So thanks yeah, for having us, Paul. At, at the end, I mean, anyone that um, has questions can Type them in the chat part or any conversation, of course. Most of you know that, but feel free. I um, I do know that there are a number of efforts um, to automate truck parking, uh, which should help. I, I hadn't thought about that um, that overlay of um, you know the incident notification and then overlay it with um, where where available parking is within that region. So I mean that's that seems very doable. Um, we have to. We'll have to take a look at, um, you know, how 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 and who we can get that that to do. I mean, we certainly within the transportation community um, with all the smart people that manage TMCs and things like that. So I think that's doable. I, I think that's we'll we'll take an action maybe to 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 follow up on that. <clears throat> and I do think there are some opportunities, increased opportunities, of working with the trucking community that that can help with this whole big. Um, uh, you know, issue there are with uh, the sh short, um, you know, the short um, shortage of drivers and uh, and the, the freight issues that we have, and and we, um, you know, I won't get into it now, but we know that's not going to get any better anytime soon, right? We know truck trucks are still going to be on the road; they're going to need to be on the road in order to keep this uh, nation's economy moving. So, um, we need to we need to I think as a collective community, a Tim community, and an IT and um, ITS community to to look at what we can do to help help this. And I think there are some opportunities there, and that. That was one that just jumped out at us. So, so John, thank you very much. Um, we really appreciate the real world uh, information, and hopefully, maybe we'll have to connect with you again and see if we uh, if, if we've made any improvements as transportation officials. And Rebecca, thank you again as always for uh, being a, a great partner. So, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. My honor. So we're going to move on to our next presentation, and um, you know, again, if there are any questions in the chat pod, or if at the end we can uh, we can um, answer answer them if you type them in. So you know, um, when we Tim Tim, what, you know, what we do with traffic incident management is not tangible, right? If if we build a bridge or we do a you know. Um, um, you know, repave a roadway. Taxpayers can see what we did, right? We, they can understand what we did. If you put out, put out a fire, firefighter puts out a fire, or a police officer arrests somebody. That's all tangible stuff. Okay, this, the, the taxpayers can see what we did. But when it comes to services related to traffic incident management, it's not so readily identifiable, right? We really can't, um, it's not tangible. So we have to do things with data and with um, benefit cost um, and, and and that's what we att we are doing with this Tim benefit class tool. Uh, it you know just a little history, and then I'll introduce the speaker. Is um, you know there was a, a period of time, um, 2013, 2014, when the states were really hurting budget wise. They're always hurting, but they were even increasingly hurting. So they were looking to cut programs, and one of those programs they were looking to cut was um, the safety service patrol programs that say, hey, why are we doing this nice little thing about giving gas away and changing tires for people and not realizing how important it is to get people off the road in some of the other services that most service patrols uh, provide, uh, like, you know, um, lane closures and traffic control and, and a bunch of other things. So, um, so you know, we, we, we said, well, we got to come up with something to fight that, uh, you know, as they start 
trying to take our service patrol programs away. So we we um, we did a research project and we came up with this, this you know this you know let's do a benefit cost tool and uh, and then while we were doing the tool, they said well um, geez it, you can use the same methodology and and to um, for other strategies Tim's strategies as well. So uh, recently Jim and I came into some money, Jim, Joe, and I came into some money, um, uh, leftover money, and they said, well, yeah, any, you know, they put out a call for ideas, and we came up with this idea about updating this tool and opportunities to, to modernize it. So um, we um, we are doing that, and we have um, Yang Yang Lu with us who is leading that effort, and so um, I will stop talking, Yang Yang, and let you talk more about it, and we're looking for everyone's participation with this um, in the end, thanks. Thank you so much, Paul. Um, good afternoon, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Ying Yan Lo. I am an associate professor at the Arizona State University, specializing in smart transportation, and also a visiting scholar with the Saxon Transportation Operations Laboratory. And um, I am uh, leading, among other projects, this effort to improve this TIM BC tool, as Paul has explained, a little history there. Uh, so this tool is developed um, in 20, in 2015-ish uh, to provide really a, an easy to use tool, less data intense for the TIM community for benefit cost analysis to uh, support the uh, program development, expansion, um, uh, apply for funding, et cetera. Uh, and it's been a while, and as Paul uh, already alluded to, that it's, it's probably time to update this tool. Uh, so this project, what we are working on, is uh, really the goal is to improve this tool uh, that's developed in 2015 uh, to make this tool more useful for the TIM community and other relevant communities. Uh, and, and this project is currently uh, uh, in progress, and we have a very short turnaround timeline. Uh, so our goal here really is to raise awareness of this tool with the TIM and other relevant communities um, to come up with a list of potential improvements to the tool, what's important to the TIM community. Uh, is, it, is it the tool can be made um, uh, more easily to use? or is it the data that needs to be updated, or is, is it the methodology behind the scenes that should be more clear, or uh, maybe even adding new strategies or taking out some of the TIM strategies that the tool currently supports, because they may or may not be um, as relevant or as, um, um, as widely ac uh, 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 accepted as, as, um, as we thought. Um, so this night deck, as you probably have noticed, uh, it's actually a presentation that's also a NOCO presentation that we did yesterday. And in that presentation, we walked through the tool, uh, how to use it, uh, and as well as the methodologies behind the scenes. Um, so today, um, I really appreciate the opportunity. So Paul, thank you for allowing 15 minutes uh, to raise awareness of this tool. Uh, at the Tim at the Talking Tim webinar uh, with a wider reach to the Tim community here. Uh, so today, instead of going over all the things that we talked about yesterday, I'm just going to go over uh, some of the um, more practical side of the of 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 the topic. Uh, so namely, how to use the tool and uh, what we hope to engage the Tim community with to support us. Uh, on this effort of improving this tool. Um, while we're at here, I would also like to mention that the webinar yesterday with more detailed um, walkthrough of the tool and detailed discussion of the methodologies behind the scenes that will be made available at some point. Um, and um, if you have any questions, please feel, feel free to reach out as well. Uh, so since our goal here is to raise awareness of the tool, come up with ideas to improve the tool, um, our main approach here is to try to engage um, stakeholders through webinars, interviews, and workshops. Uh, we also 
um, make the tool made the tool open source um, so that researchers and developers who may be interested in customizing the tool can also get their hands on that. Um, we, as part of this ongoing effort, we also developed new documentation and cleaned up the existing documentation so that it is easier to look for information about this tool. And this is where we are as far as the project progress is concerned. Uh, so before I go uh, over the next set of slides to provide a an overview of the tool, I would like to provide a few uh, links in the chat box. So this first link that I just copied over is how you can actually download the tool. Uh, just go ahead and um, click on that link. It will bring you to a USDOT FHWA web page uh, where you need to register. It's a, it's a relatively easy process. Uh, and once you register, you will be able to download the tool to play with. So that's directly downloading and using it. Um, the second link I'd like to provide here is the Confluence base that we have created. This is really where um, all the documentations have been published. And finally, uh, if any of you may be interested or interested in looking at the source code, um, or you may want your contractor, your researchers to look into it, the last link is the source code for this 10BC tool that uh, we also published. With that, um, I'm going to just go over the slides real quick to provide you an idea of what this tool looks like, how to use it, what it can do. Um, and then again, at the end, uh, what we hope to uh, engage with the TIM community to, to, to work together to improve this tool. Uh, so here on this slide, you see a screenshot. This is actually the landing page of the tool. Uh, the 10BC tool provides uh, benefits cost analysis for a range of TIM strategies. Currently, the tool has implemented the, B, the benefit cost methodologies for eight TIM strategies, as shown here in the figure. The safety service patrol, of course, is one of the major TIM strategies. Uh, there is also driver removal law, authority removal law, shared quick clearance goals, co-location, TIM task force, sharp to training, uh, and etc. The uh, the tool. The tool uh, evaluates benefits of a TIM strategy or TIM program um, in terms of travel delay, fuel consumption, emissions, and secondary incidents. And these benefits are estimated both in their native units and uh, monetary equival equivalents. The tool is very easy to use um, and less data intense than many of the other tools. And the tool's methodologies are also standardized and can be applied across all these supported TIM strategies. So use this tool. Um, the TIM program manager, a TIM program manager uh, could assess proposed expansion of existing programs, assess the potential value of creating a new program, or even compare alternatives. Um, so how to use the tool. After you download the tool from the first link that I have provided in the chat, uh, you can just simply unzip the, the file. You do have to unzip it for this shortcut to work. Uh, so double click on that shortcut to launch the landing page. This is what you see. Um, and then choose one of the modules that represents the TIM program um, that you are interested in, in evaluating. And this will bring you to a set of, this will bring, will launch this module that um, has really each module is pretty much the same. They have five pages. Um, this is a home screen where you can start a new analysis project or uh, load previously saved data um, to continue working on an existing analysis, analysis project. 
So if you start a new project, you need to give the project a name um, and provide some details, uh, program level details, in, uh, such as the state, the number of highway segments in the TIM program, study period, and your cost. And the next um, page in this tool, which is the most data intense for this tool, so it doesn't require as many data elements as uh, many other tools. Uh, this is the segment information page. So in the segment information page, uh, of course, you can enter, you're required to enter the segment level information where it is, um, which region it is in, give it a name if you would like, um, and then these four boxes each represent one set of required data elements. First up is roadway geometry, so this includes number of lanes, number of ramps, um, terrain, and curvature. In the middle, there's the input for the um, for the TIN program that you're analyzing. Uh, what is its period of operation? What is expected uh, reduction of incident durations? And for certain strategies, what is the expected percentage of incidents that this particular TIM program would be applicable to? Moving on to the right, so at the top right corner, you see the incident data itself. This is where uh, local knowledge about the number of incidents, uh, the distribution in terms of lane blockage, uh, and the average duration of each type of incident in terms of lane blockage would be. And that's where you enter that information. The secondary crash, it, num number of secondary incidents is also a benefit uh, for TIM programs. That is also required user input here. The secondary incidents as a, as a percentage of uh, the number of incidents. At the bottom of, of uh, this segment information, there's uh, the last set of required input data on traffic and weather. So the tool will then take all of these inputs to provide um, benefit estimation. A summary is provided on the last page, the last of the five. And um, there's a button to produce a PDF report where details of, of these benefits are explained, as well as second-by-second second benefit cost results. I'm going to skip the demo here and probably skip this part as well. But um, the, uh, the takeaway here on the benefit and, and cost estimate, estimation methodology is that there are a lot of analysis and data and simulation that's already, uh, that's already done, and the data coming out of those simulations uh, are modeled and uh, equations, regression equations, and other types of lookup tables, things like that, are developed and implemented in the tool itself. So this is a set of equations that estimates the travel delay as a function of the reduction of incident duration. And of course, other variables, such as lane blockage, volume, percentage of trucks, roadway gradient, these are all relevant variables that will affect the um, total delay. Fuel consumption then is estimated also based on simulation results. And in, in this, uh, for, this, for this particular benefit for fuel consumption, a lookup table um, is first produced from simulation results. And then there's a regression component added to it to account for trucks and roadway gradients. Emissions, the uh, emission benefits are estimated from fuel consumption. From fuel consumption, data from EPA on emission factor and fuel economy uh, for, are further incorporated to estimate the emissions. Uh, all of those benefits are then converted to monetary equivalents using publicly available data, which are, again, built in in this tool. 
So um, quick recap um, the, of the pro what we're doing in this project is to improve the tool and without the uh, community's input, uh, this effort would not be very successful. And so again, that's, that's why I'm here and I'm, I appreciate the opportunity um, to speak at the Talking Tim webinar uh, to really encourage the Tim community to download, uh, use this tool, test, it, test this tool, and um, to learn about this tool um, in January, early February timeframe of 2022, we are uh, planning to reach out to the community uh, with a questionnaire first, um, which would have a list of potential improvements and also questions to ask about your experience using this tool. Uh, we're also planning a workshop in February, and that will be a more active discussion on what the TIN community would like to see um, as potential improvements for this TIN BC tool. Um, and not only we're inviting TIN program managers, transportation engineers, our end users for the tool, um, if you have contractors or researchers who have done TIN benefit cost analysis for you, uh, feel free to uh, pass on the information we like to hear from them as well as far as how this tool can be improved. And um, that concludes my short recap presentation. I'll hand over back to Paul. Um, uh, thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks, Xing Yang. Um, uh, what, one thought I, well, first of all, a comment. So for everybody, um, you know, are those the strategies that we should be, you know, that we should be, um, you know, having the benefit cost for some of the ones that are in the tool? I know the service patrol is going to remain because that was the, the key one, and that's the one that's most vulnerable, uh, but um, to, to budget cuts. But the other strategies, is that is that the right strategies? Are there others that should be there? So, uh, you know, in, in due time, this is a very, this is a very uh, fast-moving project. Um, be, be, for some contractual reason, reason, reasons. So if you if you have some thoughts or you want to participate, um, you know, please please do that. Um, so um, Ying Yang, I, you know, some of that that Rebecca put up uh, that um, the cost of delays to truckers is is that something like that currently included in the tool? Yes, Paul, yes. Okay. The cost of delay for um, commercial drivers and commercial vehicles are included. Okay. Um, the data might be a few years old, though. Um, so as we have seen yesterday's webinar, that uh, updating the data is, is pretty straightforward, and, and many okay. um, many stakeholders have already brought those this up. Well, I think I know where we can get some updated um, information if we need it. So. Um. Right, Rebecca. I think um, we so, can help out. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, I, just curious. So, Jim had had some um, very frustrating moments there. He um, and I. He he could hear us, but he, we he couldn't he couldn't talk, and that's Jim's worst nightmare: not being able to talk. So, we just want to, Jim. Are you are you able to chime in? I don't know, Paul. Can you hear me? I can. We can hear you. Just want, yeah. Just wanted to know if you wanted to say say anything or um, provide the opportunity. <laughs> no, no. Let's keep going. It, it's okay. going great, and all our presenters are doing an awesome job. So maybe at okay. the end, Paul. Thank you. Okay. Well, I think I think we're at the end. Do we have any questions? Um, I don't see any in the chat pod there. Um, I d didn't see any there. Uh, yeah, so the Jim had the one about the English speaking, and Rebecca answered that. Uh, you know, d you know, there were, I've often wondered that myself. What, you know, that, is there people that we can get behind the wheel? But um, you know, I guess you, you need to be able to speak English and read the signs and 
Um, actually, there's a big, a horrific crash up in New Hampshire uh, a few years ago where uh, the truck driver couldn't understand the signs, um, and, and, and part the reason for the crash was because he didn't understand, he couldn't read English, so uh, that was just one, one issue. So, And that's why I asked the question, Paul, because yeah. I keep hearing that, so having two experts like John and Rebecca, it only made yeah. sense to, to ask the question, and I was trying to be sensitive because there are you know, everybody's driving uh, abilities are different, and uh, certainly truckers are at the top of their game when it comes to, to driving, by and large. And then, to your point, a lot of drivers that are non-commercial vehicle um, have have challenges too, right? So uh, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Whether you're commercial or, or I guess, I guess, normal citizen driver, Jim. Those are four wheelers. We call them four wheelers. Oh, okay. I thought they were no, eighteen wheelers. Oh, that's right. Four wheelers. My yeah, bad. Yeah. Car drivers are four wheelers. A little slow. Right. <laughs> excuse. Well, what excuse about the two, wheel, the two yeah. wheelers? The two wheelers. Yeah. Excuse us. But those, some of the some of the things I see four wheelers operators um, doing is horrific, right? Seeing you going 75 in a high-speed lane while looking at your cell phone, uh, things like that. It's, uh, and I'm sure John has seen some horrifying. I just see him. I'm not even on the road that much, and I'm always horrified. I, I don't think I can get on the highway, the interstate, without seeing some some um, crazy person texting while, you know, while going at a high rate of speed. It's one thing to be in at, at a stop and go traffic or something. It's another thing to be going 80 while you're looking at your phone, but um, I digress. So, yeah. just wanted to make sure there's no more questions. I think I think we're good then. Um, you know, I, I just want to take a, a second and give a special shout out to Nilo, Nilo who, who is, um, helps Jim and I and Joe out uh, uh, tremendous uh, on, you know, with these Talking Tim webinars, but with a lot of other activities. She's a true member of our team, and I just wanted to give a special shout out to, um, to you, Neil, who, who is uh, important to us, and appreciate um, it, your patience. So if you don't know, if you work with Jim and I, sometimes you need to be patient, and she's very patient with us. So, um, Joe, I, I just do, you want to, is there anything you need to say, Joe? Well, thanks, Paul. Outstanding presentations, uh, all of them. Um, and, uh, Roger, I did uh, I, I did uh, toss the link into your uh, cable barrier video, and actually took a few seconds there to multitask and take a look at that. That's outstanding job on that. Everyone, you did a fantastic job. Thanks for doing everything that you do. We all know that traffic incident management saves lives every single day. So thank you, and uh, happy holidays to all of you. Appreciate that. Yeah, when, with that, I think we'll uh, we'll wrap it up, and happy holidays to everybody that's on the call and uh, our friends, and um, uh, and we, you know, we hope that, that you know we'll increase participation in the new year on the fourth Wednesday of uh, January for our next talking, Tim, and of course you. Um, many of you know how to get to hold of Jim and I, if Joe, if you need us, and uh, we're always uh, look forward to uh, your yeah, participation. And um, thanks again, everybody, and we'll we'll um, we'll talk soon. Stay safe. See you next year. Yeah. Yeah.